Antonio Guterres was very clear that we should not treat our 75th anniversary as a big birthday party. Although there is, of course, much that, that we can celebrate and, and, and be proud of. Instead, he pointed to the big threats facing the world, from the climate crisis to rising geopolitical tensions and now COVID-19, and wanted us to focus on inspiring a global conversation on how we can overcome these challenges together. He wanted us to listen to people from all countries, all walks of life, and to crowdsource priorities and ideas for action. To date, over 1.5 million people have taken part in this conversation through surveys and dialogues held in all UN member and observer states. And despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which has basically seemed all-consuming this year, we have found that the fear of nuclear weapons and a push for nuclear disarmament is still palpable and high priority in every region. After the climate crisis, the pandemic and armed conflict, nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament were on the top priorities for people across the world in terms of things we urgently need to tackle. In every region, people who took part in our dialogues, about 3,500 or so were held in 120 countries. People urged governments to act now to avoid the spread of nuclear weapons, to new, renew disarmament agreements, and, and this was especially prominent in youth and student discussions, to ban nuclear weapons. There were also calls for greater attention to be paid to the perspective of women in discussions around nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Women and girls have always been at the sharp end of, of pretty much every global megatrend. They're also often at the vanguard of solutions and still they are underrepresented in decision-making, their voices unheard, their contributions go unharnessed. So for this reason, the UN75 team decided to partner with the group of women leaders on a series of dialogues featuring diverse female perspectives on the trends that are shaping our future. This is the sixth event in the series. Each has featured members of the group of women leaders, really an inspiring and influential group of, of role models, certainly for me, alongside senior UN leaders and women who are making their mark as activists, practitioners, and experts around the world. And today's fantastic lineup, which we'll introduce in, in a minute or so, reflects this. Each event has focused on generating recommendations on the future we want and the UN we need, which has been the theme of the 75th anniversary. Nuclear disarmament has been a long-standing aim of the UN. We have made progress, I'm sure we'll talk about that today, but it can feel frustratingly slow and fragile. That's certainly what we've been hearing from people around the world. We know from our global consultation that at this turbulent time, people are worried and they are thinking big. They, they, they're crying out for change. Our challenge will be to rise to these expectations. The pandemic has shown that huge transformations are possible when political will is aligned with public support. If we can apply this to other areas, to other challenges, then there is still a chance that this difficult year may yet come to be remembered as the year we changed course to a safer, fairer and more sustainable future. And I'm delighted with that to hand over to our brilliant moderator, Ben Donaldson, Head of Campaigns at UNA UK, which has been a fantastic and steadfast partner to UN75 over this year. Over to you, Ben. Thanks so much, Natalie, for outlining this really impressive and wide-reaching UN75 global consultation. And it's a consultation that today we will be enriching further with the comments and recommendations of our very distinguished group of panelists who will be speaking on the issue of nuclear disarmament. But before I introduce the panel, I always think it's useful when talking about this issue to put the politics and the abstract narratives to one side for a moment and just ground ourselves and remind ourselves exactly what it is we're discussing. 75 years ago, in, in August 1945, nuclear bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The blasts themselves killing over 200,000 people while maiming and injuring tens of thousands more with severe ongoing consequences for the survivors due to radiation exposure and due to the huge psychological trauma. 
Now, the United Nations was born out of this dark period just a few months later and set as its unequivocal first commitment the elimination from national armaments of atomic weapons and all other major weapons adaptable to mass destruction. Now, we fast forward 75 years and despite the host of non-proliferation and disarmament agreements, the task of eliminating these weapons remains incomplete. Looking ahead, there are reasons for concern, but also reasons for optimism and opportunities. For instance, the groundswell of support, which has led to the imminent entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, as well as a pivotal moment ahead for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as the rescheduled review conference is set to take place in 2021. With me to discuss these opportunities that lie ahead um, is our fantastic panel that we're, we're lucky to have here with us today. Um, firstly, Her Excellency Margot Volström, former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and a former um, Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict, as well as a member of the Group of Women Leaders, our co one of our co-hosts for today's event, um, as well as Izumi Nakamitsu, the UN's High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. Also, Alicia sanders zakra uh, policy and Research Coordinator for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and Marjan Nerzan, Convener of Abolition 2000 Youth Network and Coordinator for the Commonwealth of Independent States uh, Section of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Now, to, to get the discussion going and frame the discussion, I'll be asking a panelist, our panellists a couple of questions. Um, the first one being, what progress has been made on the UN Gen General Assembly's inaugural commitment to eliminate nuclear weapons and what lessons can we draw from how this progress was achieved? But before I invite um, Margot to respond to this in the first instance, um, I would like to explain to audience members that we will be using the Q&A chat functionality on um, this Zoom webinar. So simply uh, type your question into the box. You'll see the Q&A box on, on the bottom of your screen type your question in and when we get round to the Q&A, I will be putting as many of these questions as possible to our distinguished panel. So without further ado, if I could um, call on Margot to um, answer this first question, what progress has been made on the UN General Assembly's inaugural commitment to eliminate nuclear weapons? And what lessons can we draw from this? Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, in preparing for, for this, um, I uh, remembered the words of Albert Einstein because he said that the release of, um, of atom power has changed everything except our way of thinking. And actually, if we look at um, the, today's world and if we do a kind of reality check, so um, it, it makes up a rather bleak picture and one can think that not much has been learned during these 75 years. Um, we um, still have 13,500 nuclear weapons, 90% of those are possessed by the US and, and Russia. Uh, we live in an era of international tensions and distrust um, re renewed uh, major power competition and uh, destabilizing uh, new technologies. We have uh, nuclear weapons, we see nuclear weapons being modernized uh, and there is um, an incipient nuclear arms race. Uh, I think we can, we can say that. Uh, and also existing treaties uh, on weapons control are undermined or busted. Um, more countries are striving for becoming nuclear states uh, so and also the rhetoric is changing uh, it sounds atomic strategic deterrence has replaced uh, the taboo that uh, has existed uh, since decades now so this makes a very uh, uh, dark uh, picture um, and um, this is actually a failure of of the, the global community that we have not been able to do more to get rid of, of nuclear weapons. Of course, a glimmer of hope is the, the nuclear ban treaty and it will enter into force on the 22nd of, of January. 
um, uh, and it, it marks a new sort of hopeful face in, in the struggle to prevent nuclear war and also eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think the fact that, that women, since this is part of our conversation today, I think women's um, um, engagement and activities, and, and that has also been going on for a hundred years, uh, uh, that that has shaped very much of our understanding and the popular support for doing something about nuclear weapons and getting rid of nuclear weapons. So I, I think that um, they their role should be um, highlighted when we talk about uh, efforts being made and progress being made. It is it has very much been been driven by, by women around the world and often they have worked uh, alongside men but uh, also very often decided to, to shape their own organizations and find their own way of, of doing things and, and that is uh, a lesson uh, learned I think that um, uh, we have to define uh, security in a, in a different way. Uh, and I think especially now when we see uh, in the middle of this, uh, and I will finish with that, in this social and economic crisis created by a pandemic and at a time when everybody worries about where and how to find money uh, to pay for unemployment, to make uh, sure that the schools uh, still uh, uh, can function and get money to healthcare, there is big money. There is billions and billions of dollars going to, to uh, trade in weapons. This is where there is always money, it seems. And I, I actually think that the pandemic has laid bare the, the, uh, the need to define security based on human needs rather than military might. And I think women have contributed throughout history uh, in doing so and bringing about those arguments and I hope they will continue uh, to fight for a world without nuclear weapons. Thanks so much, that's really com a compelling case you've made for spending less of the world's um, money on, on nuclear weapons and thinking more about what's actually required in order to put the world on a, on a better course. Thank you, thank you Margot. Um, Izumi Nakamitsu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for starting out with um, really pointing out and emphasizing a very close link between the United Nations and, and nuclear disarmament. As you, as you rightly pointed out, it has been one of the highest priorities for the UN and definitely the highest priority in the disarmament uh, actions of, at the United Nations. Now, let's uh, very briefly, very quickly review the 75 years of progress um, and uh, slowed progress, etc. What's interesting, uh, probably um, the progress in the elimination um, movement um, can be characterized as hap haphazard. You know, years of inaction have been punctuated by periods of intense uh, progress, and very often this progress was precipitated by crisis. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of 62 uh, was followed by only a year later um, uh, something that was uh, quite a landmark in the testing uh, issues. It's partial um, um, nuclear test fund treaty um, of uh, 63 and of course um, NPT, non-proliferation treaty, which was signed in 68. Uh, another example is the, the you know, intense arms race uh, dynamics that continued throughout um, 80s. I remember those days, um, which was, of course, followed by, uh, still before the end of the Cold War, uh, INF Treaty signed between the United States and then Soviet Union, uh, which was signed in 87. Um, so, um, so it's been, you know, um, period of progress, period of crisis, et cetera. Uh, it, but, uh, but we have uh, um, really during this, uh, the course of the 75 years, we have been able to establish three core norms uh, related to nuclear disarmament. One is of course a norm against testing, uh, which of course resulted in CTBT, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, 
uh, yet to be, of course, um, entering into force, but uh, at least that was agreed at the multilateral level. Uh, and of course, the norm against uh, uh, non-proliferation, norm against proliferation, uh, which is now enshrined in the NPT, uh, still uh, uh, really a core part of our international security regime. And of course, most importantly, uh, the norm against use, uh, which has been upheld uh, since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, very fortunately, I will add. Now, international nuclear disarmament uh, and non-proliferation regime is really a uh, web of um, bilateral uh, regional arrangements, um, you know, they are um, those uh, um, regional agreements that established nuclear weapon free zones in various parts of the world. And if you look at the, the population, close to 70% of people around the world actually live uh, in uh, nuclear weapon um, free uh, arrangements. Um, so, um, you know, uh, and of course the multilateral ones. Um, what we now, of course, see as we speak is that we are entering into probably arms, um, 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 arms race dynamics, as Margot rightly pointed out. There has been a qualitative arms race already. Um, nuclear weapon states are uh, investing huge amounts of money to modernize uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and, um, you know, various other types of uh, um, weapons, um, hypersonic weapons, uh, there are lots of uh, new um, potential technology uh, applied to weaponry uh, being discussed and, and developed um, as we speak. So we're entering into arms race dynamics. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. Um, I think that they, there has been uh, quite an important uh, awareness expressed by majority of states, um, you know, that this is not the right way of spending precious resources. The, the, the most recent first committee, um, quite a lot of member states indeed talked about um, the resource issue and, and we need to in fact use those resources for fighting um, other kinds of uh, um, uh, challenges such as the COVID and of course uh, uh, climate change, etc. Now, I'm sure we will hear about uh, TPNW, the Treaty um, on the um, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, this was yet again a, a really strong uh, um, expression of voice uh, from the majority of states around the world. Um, a frustration against the, the slow pace or, if you will, reverse trends in nuclear disarmament. We have been collectively making um, uh, progress. Um, but that progress in recent years have stopped and then started to, to reverse course. And um, TPNW was probably one of the most strongest um, uh, expression of frustration and the political voice really coming from uh, civil society uh, organizations pushed uh, very largely uh, by women's organizations and then women actually at the forefront of um, making sure that governments around the world, including nuclear weapon states, actually return to uh, more serious efforts uh, towards the elimination uh, of nuclear weapons. And I think um, it, it is now um, a reality. It will enter into force on 22nd of January. And hopefully this will become a positive uh, political voice that will push um, states uh, to return to um, uh, nuclear uh, disarmament efforts. There are many uh, different avenues that they could take uh, if nuclear weapon states are not able to join the TPNW immediately, uh, then there are other uh, opportunities next year, uh, starting with the uh, 75th anniversary of the first resolution adopted. Um, but in August, we will have, um, of course, the, um, the, the review conference of the NPT. Uh, and um, uh, TPNW also uh, in um, all likelihood will have its first uh, state parties conference um, within next year. So let us use uh, those opportunities uh, next year, 2021. Thank you so much. And that's such a good positive um, sort of 
launch pad really for the discussion there are lots of opportunities lots of avenues that you've just mentioned and um it's going to be 2021 and beyond it feels like it's going to be about making the most of those different avenues um and on that note um without further ado i'm going to alicia from ICANN. thank you alicia great uh thank you so much for having me here today it's a real pleasure to to join you virtually along such excellent panelists. I've really enjoyed the, the responses so far. Um, so un, unsurprisingly, I will focus my remarks on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, not just because it's the focus of my work with ICANN, uh, but also because the treaty itself and, and how it was negotiated really uh, embodies uh, the UN spirit of multilateralism and of course uh, the core commitment to disarmament. Uh, that has been you know, mentioned several times already. Um, so just to recap, as has been mentioned, the treaty was adopted in 2017 and just at the end of October uh, reached the threshold of 50 uh, ratifications or accessions for it to be able to enter into force on the 22nd of January next year. Um, you know, I really consider it a, a remarkable testament to the commitment of uh, all the countries that have joined it uh, to disarmament, to, multilateralism, to multilateralism, uh, to have signed and ratified this treaty in the midst of a, a global pandemic uh, to make this possible. Uh, it really is a, a landmark nuclear weapons treaty, the first international treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, um, but it's also groundbreaking in other ways. You know, for the first time, this treaty requires that uh, states parties provide uh, assistance to victims of nuclear weapons use and testing, uh, specifically age and gender sensitive assistance. Areas that have been contaminated by nuclear weapons use and testing must be remediated. Uh, the treaty recognizes the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous communities. And I think this is really due to, to the process to achieve the TPNW, looking to this question about what are some lessons that we can learn. Uh, the negotiations were really led by, you know, this has been mentioned already, really led by many groups and communities that unfortunately are, are too often marginalized in international security discussions, but who clearly should have an equal say in their own security and in global security. We saw the leadership from small island countries, from civil society impacted by nuclear weapons use and testing, the real experts, as we say on nuclear weapons. And of course, from female diplomats and activists uh, that really led the movement and, and resulted in this, this incredible treaty. So although, you know, it's often said the nuclear armed states, uh, you know, no, they did not choose to, to be at these negotiations. They have not joined the treaty yet. But it's really important that so many other really critical stakeholders in the international community did choose to be there and have led this process. Uh, and something that I think is really important to remember and take forward in creating a more stable uh, and peaceful security environment for all is that inclusivity. Um, as the treaty enters into force and takes full legal effect in, in January, uh, the stigma against nuclear weapons will continue to grow and to really spread to all countries. We've already seen the effect in, in nuclear armed states. Um, we see that nuclear armed state capitals like Washington DC and Paris, France, uh, have signed up to the ICANN Cities Appeal to actually call on their governments to join the treaty. Um, so we think, you know, the 22nd of January will be a historic day on the pathway towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. And as a broad, inclusive, feminist and anti-racist campaign, ICANN looks forward to continuing to work uh, with all states and communities around the world to achieve the full implementation and universalization of this treaty. Thank you, Alicia. That was a really refreshing um, overview of, of the TPNW and the different facets about it that, you know, that, that some, some people um, out there might not be so aware about these cities signing up and the pressure being brought on, you know, sub-national level, the pre pressure that is still being brought upon um, um, national um, governments on this issue. And that, that's really fascinating. Um, now, Marjan, um, over to you next for, for the initial question. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everybody. And uh, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And I'm very humbled to be in this setup, surrounded by women professionals uh, in the field. 
And uh, let me start with some uh, positive aspects because I think we've heard uh, already about some critical assessments. Uh, and um, firstly, uh, nuclear weapons uh, were not used since 1945, and we have uh, witnessed the decline in the numbers of the nuclear weapons from 60,000 uh, in the 1980s to what, what is now like uh, 14,000, around 14,000 nuclear weapons. However, uh, it's a topic for the debate because we know that nuclear weapons now are much stronger in their capacity uh, and they are being modernized. Uh, secondly, um, the nuclear weapon free zones, uh, which I would like to mention about uh, the regional approach to the global uh, security. And there has been a lot of work done uh, by the uh, UNODA, United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs, uh, which was um, quite uh, helpful in setting up, for example, the Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, and uh, these nuclear weapon free zones, they comprise uh, over the half uh, of the world uh, in terms of territories. Uh, and um, the P5, they are actually providing uh, negative security assurances uh, to the non-nuclear weapon states, which are part uh, party to the uh, nuclear weapon free zones uh, agreements. Uh, and um, this is uh, actually uh, giving us um, some sort of hope as well that we can um, expand the nuclear weapon free zones to other parts which are not still yet to this. And speaking from the um, experience of Kazakhstan and the nuclear legacy, um, so after the collapse of the USSR, Kazakhstan inherited 1,500 uh, nuclear weapons, and this could be uh, back then the fourth biggest nuclear arsenal. However, uh, given the, um, um, the catastrophic impact which nuclear weapons and the testing had uh, on the lives of people of Kazakhstan, especially uh, of the residents in the Syripolitan's nuclear test site, um, which experienced the uh, horrors of the nuclear weapons testing, uh, almost one third of the world testing, which is uh, around, um, sorry, not one third, one fourth of all the nuclear uh, tests were um, conducted at the territory of which is now uh, Kazakhstan, the Simpolitis nuclear test site. And of course, uh, given this um, tragic part of the history, Kazakhstan decided to uh, choose a nuclear weapon free pass and um, the role of civil society actors was quite uh, significant uh, because the anti-nuclear movement Nivara Simi was uh, quite instrumental in uh, shutting down the Simi nuclear test site. And um, Kazakhstan was also uh, quite successful in facilitating uh, the cooperation between United States and uh, Russia through the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Um, which was about to um, securely and safely dismantle the nuclear weapons which Kazakhstan inherited uh, from the Soviet Union. And this is also showing us an example in which countries uh, can cooperate and work in a collaborative way. Uh, and finally, I would like to also mention that last year, uh, the United Nations resolution on youth disarmament and non-proliferation was adopted, which is highlighting the role of young people uh, in uh, contributing to positive changes uh, in global peace and security, as well as highlighting the disarmament and non proliferation And here I would like to commend the work of the um, uh, UNODA in establishing the uh, website called useforDisarmament.org, which provides a lot of resources, uh, materials and information to actually keep younger generation updated about nuclear disarmament and ways in which they can uh, get engaged. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'll try and find a link to that uh, website that you've just mentioned there, Marjan, um, so I can put it out into the, the webinar chat. Um, so that's great. We, we've looked at the last sort of, you know, what's happened in the past. And now let's let's sort of mercilessly focus on how, how we can um, make progress in, in the sort of months and years to come. Um, and a, as part of this UN 75 dialogue, it's about, it's about um, capturing recommendations that um, but th that are within the Secretary General's gift to, to implement and that the UN can sort of focus on as part of the follow-up process to the UN 75 declaration as, as um, described by Natalie in, in her introduction. So the set, my second question is, part, is, is, is fulfilling this part of the, the dialogue as, as, um, 
as a UN 75 dialogue is, is fulfilling this part of the format. And that's, um, you know, the, si since we are trying to generate recommendations for the Secretary General's follow up report for the UN 75 declaration, which is building on this idea of the future we want, how can we move forward on nuclear disarmament in the coming months and years, given the SG's warning that um, in, in October, his warning that um, progress has stalled um, and is at risk of backsliding on some nuclear disarmament related issues. So I'd like to just, um, if, if each panelist could spend just um, a, a minute or two um, saying what their sort of top top sort of recommendation would be that they'd want to see um, reflected um, in the Secretary General's follow up work. Um, that would be fantastic. And actually, since this is a UN initiative that um, that UN ODA is is no doubt um, closely involved in, I think um, it would make sense for me to to come to you first, Iz Izumi. Okay, thank you. Well, there are actually a lot of things that we would like to see happening. I mean, but amongst the, the first one, and, and it is quite an urgent issue, uh, is um, for states to really return to um, publicly acknowledging various issues. For example, we committing to the uh, shared um, uh, goal of uh, um, pursuit of uh, a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, I, we think that... Um, uh, 75th anniversary in January next year of the first General Assembly resolution will be a really good opportunity for states to do that. Uh, but uh, following that, you know, we want all states to um, understand and, and, and acknowledge that um, uh, disarmament is not a utopian ideal. It is actually about our security and, and it is a useful practical uh, instrument to prevent and mitigate and resolve uh, um, conflicts. Um, we, of course, um, as I have been uh, many times repeating, uh, we need to, to make sure that uh, um, uh, key arms control and disarmament bilateral treaties like New START uh, will be extended uh, so that we will be able to, if you will, buy time uh, to think about, and this is my final point, um, as I mentioned a little bit, the world has really dramatically changed. And therefore, as the Secretary General has mentioned uh, before, um, we probably need a new vision for arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. So um, we need to encourage states to have a, a serious dialogues and discussions, reflection uh, processes, if you will, on what kind of a new approach will be required uh, in our new uh, environment, in a new international security uh, context. Um, in, and, uh, you know, that should probably include uh, questions such as how to multilateralize um, the arms control processes, uh, including all kinds of uh, nuclear weapons in arms control. Um, how can we address the nexus between nuclear risk and new technologies and also new domains, potential domains of conflict, uh, and also uh, create uh, long overdue constraints in missiles, uh, for example, and, and, and other delivery vehicles. So there are a whole range of issues that um, we need to, or the international community collectively needs to put uh, our minds together and, and reflect upon. Uh, and this work is becoming quite urgent um, because of the deterioration uh, of the, the international security environment. So UN, um, you know, uh, there are things that we're not very good at, but uh, one thing that I believe we are still very good at um, is that it is a, a, a useful uh, convening uh, a platform. Um, and um, a platform where we can also support with um, expert advice and, and knowledge research, etc., cetera, um, and also uh, increased uh, efforts in facilitating genuine and civil and sincere dialogues between member states. So um, 2021, um, we hope we'll be able to uh, start such a process. Um, and, um, and that's why this uh, common agenda making, which has started under the leadership of the Secretary General, uh, is also very uh, important. I love that Gen genuine and sincere communication. So I think that's that's uh, definitely something that that will improve um, work in so many different sectors. 
Um, uh, Margot, what would you like to see um, reflected in, in the SG's follow-up report um, next year? First of all, I think we have to uh, realise that there is a particular responsibility that falls on uh, the US and Russia, those that possess most of, of the world's nuclear weapons, they have a particular responsibility and that has to be pointed out and they have to be reminded of that. I am hopeful that uh, with a new president in the United States at least they can put uh, every plan to, uh, to uh, restart uh, nuclear weapons tests. Uh, um, and, and to put that away um, and uh, I hope also return to or uh, prolong start for example so the return to agreements and treaties that allows uh, a weapons control and arms control and I think that that is also a responsibility on on all states uh, around the world and of course they will be helped by uh, the will that has been expressed by all those that have signed up to the, uh, the, the ban treaty now. And I, I think the other states and the nuclear weapon states must feel the pressure, must, must um, um, realize that people all over the world uh, want them to, to act responsibly. I think we have to renew the taboo. And I don't know, I mean, I, I think the way it has been worded um, is, is excellent, but I, I, we can see slowly also that the rhetoric, as I said uh, in the beginning, that, that it is changing, but maybe we need to, to find ways to, to renew that, uh, that taboo, or if we need a new formulation, let's find that in, in that case, to, to have it in a modern way um, as well. Uh, although I, I think it, it was great. And I think we have to mobilize women. Uh, again, uh, we have to make sure that we leave room for, for women's engagement. And, and that can happen through, uh, for example, making alliances with women's organizations, supporting their uh, participation in discussions and, and uh, um, uh, in also um, negotiations on, on these issues um, to make sure that women participate in peace negotiations, uh, of course, and uh, to make sure that women uh, appear in equal numbers also on bodies that uh, uh, work on disarmament uh, issues and at conferences. Uh, and we have to facilitate women's organizing around peace and disarmament uh, issues. And as Renata Dwan, I think, put it um, very elegantly in, in a, an article, uh, she said that uh, she was head of, of UNIDIR. Um, she said that uh, uh, to achieve uh, the full and meaningful participation of women, Gender mainstreaming must go beyond numbers to encompass the assumptions and ways in which the world defines, makes and implements control over weapons. It means asking who controls a weapon, who is affected by it and how. It means looking at the ways in which security, power and authority are defined. Uh, so I think you have to understand that it is a uh, um, it goes deeper than only looking at the numbers of, of women and the representation of women, but, but also how do we define security and to make sure that, that women and women's organizations are part of the work for, for uh, nuclear disarmament is, uh, is crucial for the future. Brilliant. And I hope part of today's event with such a strong, you know, female panel here before us, um, you know, helps make that point even more. And I know that um, the, the work that ICANN um, has done has also, you know, been, been had, had women at the forefront of leading that campaign and initiative. Um, so, um, Alicia, in terms of um, the SG's report next year and this follow on process, what steps can be taken and what would what recommendations would you, you like to see and, and, and I can would, would like to see um, appear in this um, this sort of action agenda that, that's due to be released in September 2021? Great. Um, well, I think we, we need to use the tools that we have uh, and we have an incredible tool in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 
Uh, and we need to kind of use that to its full, fullest extent uh, and work towards full universalization and implementation of this treaty. Um, you know, the TPNW helps to stigmatize and delegitimize nuclear weapons and the practice of nuclear deterrence uh, that many nuclear armed states and their allies uh, often rely on as an excuse to keep these weapons of mass destruction. So the more that we work towards the universalization of this treaty, um, the more that its normative and institutional power uh, will grow and the more difficult it will be for nuclear armed states uh, to continue to hold on to these weapons. Um, that's, that's why it's so important to be building up this prohibitive norm, to be building up this taboo, as has been mentioned, uh, against nuclear weapons. And the TPNW is a really valuable tool uh, to work towards that, um, to ensure that nuclear weapons are never used uh, again, and to, to really push states to, to actually take meaningful steps towards disarmament. Uh, and there's, there's widespread support for this treaty among UN member states. Uh, we expect in the months and years for signatories and states parties uh, to continue to grow uh, as, as countries finalize their processes of ratification uh, and, and, uh, and join the treaty. Um, so there's really a kind of a role for, for everyone uh, to, to promote universalization and implementation of the treaty from students uh, to scientists to activists and certainly uh, the United Nations. And so we're really you know, eager and looking forward to seeing uh, the contributions of all these groups uh, towards this important goal and, and reflection of that uh, you know, with the, the Secretary General's report. Brilliant. So the strong support for the TPNW from this, you know, increased leadership, if anything, from the Secretary General on the TPNW would um, would play play that useful role as far as I can, um, as far as I can see it. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Marjan, um, in terms of um, your, your the networks you're part of and um, and, and um, what issues and, and recommendations would you like to see covered um, by the UN in it with more emphasis? Yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, I would say that, uh, as Alicia also already mentioned uh, about the nuclear deterrence, I think we need to move from nuclear deterrence to a common security uh, and based on the human security approach. Uh, secondly, nuclear weapon states should adopt no first use policy. Uh, thirdly, um, probably you have heard about the Stockholm Initiative, so-called stepping stones, uh, which is also could be used as a tool to undertake the initial nuclear risk reduction, uh, as well as disarmament measures. And um, another point that I would like to make is about um, that we should be aiming for a positive peace so that we are sustaining equality, harmony, justice, and not on the negative piece. And at the same time, we should be aiming for the uh, economic justice, since it has been already mentioned that uh, nuclear weapons budget is equal to one trillion US dollars. And this money could be spent uh, to, um, to fund um, the needs of people, to redirect them towards sustainable development goals, to fight the global pandemic, to fight the climate crisis. Uh, and um, here I would like to use the opportunity to mention that there are two uh, campaigns and initiatives uh, which I would like to um, mention and suggest to check them out. The first one is called Move the Nuclear Weapons Money Campaign. It's a global campaign to cut the nuclear weapons budget uh, and uh, redirect them towards sustainable development goals. Uh, it's also providing the practical measures as well as an examples. And the second one is called the Don't Bank on the Bond, which uh, probably uh, people are also aware uh, how one can um, uh, fight with the banks which are actually um, investing into the nuclear weapons uh, industry. And uh, to the end, I would like to say that uh, it's great, of course, to have uh, young people and women included, but I think it's also um, important to um, take into account the regional representation, uh, the geographical diversity, especially inclusion of uh, women of color uh, and young people from uh, disadvantaged areas. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, brilliant. Um, well, um, that, this is great. Um, that, that's, such, that's such a sort of um, tangible set of 
ideas which um, I know Natalie will be listening to carefully and feeding in um, to the UN 75 conversation consultation machine um, and we also have a recording of this which, which I'm sure we can submit through um, through um, the UN 75 office as well um, so now I mean I'm just scrolling through a, a really fantastic um, bunch of questions here and I think what I'll do is I'll read out a number of them grouped together in as best I can on, on um, uh, different themes and then give because um, I'm mindful of we, this is now a long event it, it we haven't got much time to answer this so I'll rattle through as many as I can then ask each panelist to um, give their thoughts and reflections on on that set of questions um, so just looking at what we've got um, there's there's good questions about the cyber vulnerabilities um, a couple of good questions from Daniel Scharf and David Willicombe uh, on the w whether or not the the, the sort of new, um, progression in AI and, and cyber warfare actually uh, mean makes accidental use more likely and, and is dangerous for the command and co control structures out there. There's a great question from Bruce Kent on morality, which is very simply that Pope Francis has condemned as immoral that even the possession of nuclear weapons as instruments of mass murder. Does the panel agree with this? Um, then there's uh, uh, questions relating um, to Biden's um, election as US president on de-alerting and, and um, the opportunity for new start and um, other concrete me measures like no first use from Alan Ware and a, a related question I think from Ilya Said on um, the impact of the introduction of tactical nuclear bombs on non-proliferation and wh maybe whether or not that's something that um, we could see um, a stepping back from um, given Biden's um, election and um, then actually the confidence in international institutions such a key issue um, if the UN is going to play that role as convener um, the, the, the global public and, and states need to have, have confidence in, in, in that institution. And um, how can the UN be strengthened um, in order to, to create that confidence from Adewale Bakare? Um, and then we've had the most questions actually on the TPMW um, about um, how can we encourage certain MPT states to reverse their combative negative approach to the TPMW? Um, is the TPMW not complementary? Um, with the NPT and um, what's the best make, best way to make sure that the 22 January um, news is, is widely shared and then an interesting one about Commonwealth members given that you know more than a third of Commonwealth members have signed the TPMW is this something that could be brought up at the Commonwealth um, heads of government meeting um, a plan for next year as well um, and then another a related question about challenging deterrence and this thing about making um, talk, talk about nuclear web weapons abstract about deterrence and forgetting the, uh, the actual reality of nuclear weapons. Um, so that a really fantastic set of questions, plenty for our panelists to get their teeth into. Um, I think I might um, come to you first, Izumi, just because the, the, the UN question there is so good about the trust in the institution, as well as, well as this, this question of um, ha the UN guidance on um on the complementarity of the tpnw and and the npt and how you know how 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 that sort of arms control uh, mechanisms can work together positively um over to you yeah thanks ben um these are very good questions um first of all uh, trust and confidence in the un system absolutely um you know the reason why the secretary general consistently um, emphasized the importance of un reform uh, is not just to, to respond to, you know, um, the need to streamline and, and, and save costs, uh, quite the contrary. We need, we are fully aware that we have to really restore and strengthen public confidence in institutions such as the United Nations. Now, as you know, um, during the 75th, um, you know, uh, survey, um, fortunately, um, a vast majority of the world public actually has uh, expressed a trust and, and, and also expressed the, the, their belief that uh, institutions uh, called the United Nations is actually quite indispensable. Um, so we would like to build on that and we need to make sure that um, you know, we continuously strengthen our uh, role, and and um, and that can only be possible if we respond to the the requirements of uh, various um, member states, but also um, the public um, citizens um, or uh, as a whole. 
I would like to remind ourselves, this is something that I often mention, um, our UN Charter actually starts with the word, we the peoples. Um, so while the, the United Nations is an intergovernmental platform, um, you know, this is a platform traditionally, um, you know, gathers um, the state representatives. Um, let us go back to the realization um, that, um, you know, uh, we the peoples also expect, um, you know, states and international organizations to uh, perform its duties uh, so that we will be responding to the, the needs of citizens around the world. And, and nuclear disarmament simply is one of those uh, expectations uh, from the citizens. Um, so we will uh, absolutely uh, uh, strive to, to improve ourselves and, and strengthen our institution and therefore uh, hopefully uh, continue to serve uh, the people that we are supposed to be serving and then the confidence and the trust will be accorded. Um, but uh, this said, UN is not the only platform for discussions. As I said, um, it is a combination of various instruments and tools that we need to collectively utilize. Um, the United Nations is an instrument itself uh, created by uh, the member states uh, and we strive to be an effective instrument that serves the purpose. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it's not the uh, only uh, um, a platform where this disarmament issues will be discussed. And, and I'm actually looking at people on the screen, um, you know, platforms like this one, young people gathering and discussing these issues are increasingly uh, uh, important, huge assets. Um, and, and that's why uh, the new multilateralism that we need uh, is more inclusive and more networked multilateralism, uh, not the traditional kind of multilateral conversations that we've been having for the, the past 75. We need to change with the time. Thank you. Um, and just looking at the time, we're, we're, we're certainly um, have about six minutes left on the official build one hour. And I'm just wondering if panelists would be able to just spare a few extra minutes to um, to have this round of questions uh, or whether or not anyone needs to leave hard at um, the half past the hour. Um, we, can you give me a thumbs up if you can just, we, we can do a few extra minutes to keep on working through these fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Margo, um, you, there was a lot to get through in, in, the, in the questions that I sort of rattled out there. There was certainly some, some ones quite relevant to, to um, Northern Europe and Sweden. Um, and um, yes, did like, really interested to hear your take on, on that. Um, well, it's, um, it's very demanding on us when we uh, now have the doomsday clock set on 100 seconds to, to midnight, because it's, it's about the norms and uh, a kind of normative reorientation of, of the agenda that is defining security in, in a different way as human security. Uh, and, uh, and that's a big, uh, a big deal and not something you do from one day to another. Um, I think we need to, as uh, Alicia and others have said, we need to use the instruments we have, the legal frameworks and agreements and treaties that exist. We have to make sure that we, that we control the implementation of, of these and that we get uh, also states to um, speak well about multilateralism and engage in multilateral uh, discussions and, and decisions. Uh, and that has not that is not a given uh, as it is today. We see much more of the nationalistic autocratic uh, way of, of steering and leading countries uh, and we need to have to get the public engaged. We need to create a debate as uh, Zumi pointed out as well, where young people and women, those that are not there around the tables where these things are being decided where, or designed we have to get them to to be listened to we have to to provide the platforms for them to to discuss it um, and uh, i think that many of the there were such 
clever questions asked here because this is exactly what we do in the advisory board on disarmament matters and we write a report to uh, secretary general guterres uh, and we try to to uh, answer some of these questions and give him some ideas for for the future and we are still in in that uh, process for example new weapons te technologies what will that mean for for the existing i mean they they go under the radar so to say we we have not captured uh, everything that has happened with weapons technology in the existing treaties so do we need new treaties do we need to add something to existing uh, uh, agreements or or how do we deal with that and what will it mean for for example the whole idea of deterrence nuclear uh, weapons deterrence so uh, all of that is, uh, you know, there are no simple questions, but something that really has to be discussed. And I can understand when people get upset about not being asked about something that will affect the whole world. And a nuclear attack would be so devastating to life on this planet that people have a right to be uh, involved and listened to and engaged in in different ways. So I think, yeah, for example, the the Stockholm conference was also a way to one of the last things that I did uh, when I was a, a foreign minister. So to take that initiative to get those countries that care a lot about democracy and also care about uh, um, disarmament matters to. Uh, have them come together to see what what steps can we take, what can we do now already, um, uh, even if we don't make, uh, uh, we, we take the small steps and start by, by, by doing that and we work together. Uh, so I, I think much more of, of this and of course I'm hoping more countries will introduce also a, a feminist foreign policy because I really think that that, uh, that helps women to to, uh, to to come together to have a, a proper role and it's it's not only it's inclusive um, and establishes uh, principles for checking on rights representation and resources and and I think that that can be a, a tool now I did not succeed uh, it's a failure on my part that I could not uh, uh, convince uh, or get the support uh, by Swedish Parliament to to um, um, sign up to the uh, to the nuclear ban, I hope that that will still be possible. At least uh, I managed to leave it open for Sweden to to um, uh, to to come back to that, and I hope that that will be possible. Uh, but it takes a, a debate. It takes really a way to mobilize public support uh, for it, and uh, I can only wish uh, everybody uh, all the best. Also from from January to continue to work on, on these issues. Thank you so much, Margot. Um, well, it feels like January is going to be a massive moment for, for the TPNW. And the, as every single speaker has noted, the, the, the public support and the public conversation needs, needs to, to be upped and, and um, there, there needs to be that energy there. And, and you know, if we're going to make this progress, because it, need, it needs to be cracked out of the sort of political, stuffy, um, exclusive confines and just becoming becoming an issue that, that there's more widespread awareness and sort of um, engagement with. And it feels like the, the TPNW is part of the answer to that, a massive part of the answer to that. And so I'm really positive to hear what you, you just said about that. And I'm um, coming to you, Alicia, for, for, for more on this and, and this, this positivity that that can inject. Thanks. Um, so I will try to address uh, three of the, the questions, um, starting with the first about uh, the, the possession of nuclear weapons being immoral. Um, I think this, I mean, this was a really huge moment, uh, actually, when the Pope came out and declared that, that just possessing nuclear weapons uh, is immoral. Previously, the Catholic Church uh, had said that it, it would be okay to pursue a policy of nuclear deterrence. Uh, and, and to possess nuclear weapons. Um, and it's a really good example of how attitudes can really shift on nuclear weapons and how the stigma can be advanced. Um, you know, the, the Holy See was a really uh, important contributor to the negotiations and, and, and to the treaty uh, after kind of that shift in opinion uh, from the church. And, you know, of course, we, we certainly agree uh, that uh, the possession of 
nuclear weapons, of instruments of mass murder, uh, is immoral, you know, not just from a, an international, you know, legal perspective, but really actually from kind of a, a realist perspective of international relations in that uh, possessing nuclear weapons means at some point they will be used. And the risk of nuclear weapons use is increasing. Uh, we've seen that with the mention of the doomsday clock. Uh, this relates to a lot of the questions about new technologies. Uh, there's a lot that we still don't know. There's a lot of research being done about how uh, you know, increasing application of artificial intelligence and, and cyber technologies can really increase the risk of nuclear weapons use. So we have to be realistic uh, that ultimately we can't control these weapons of mass destruction. And daring, uh, you know, having the arrogance to possess these weapons is, is something that, that humanity cannot afford. Um, so that's my, my comment on that question. Um, in terms of uh, the, the TPNW complementary to the NPT question, um, this has been addressed by a number of different diplomats uh, and experts. If you go back and, and actually look at kind of the record of the negotiations of the treaty, you'll hear time and time again, uh, states parties echoing their support for the NPT, uh, that they see the TPNW as a measure to complement uh, the NPT um, and the, the safeguard system. Um, there are a number of, of pieces that have been written about that from Diplomats um, like the Austrian diplomat Thomas Pajanowski wrote a piece about this, as well as uh, you know an international uh, nuclear policy expert Tariq Roth also recently wrote a piece about this, um, which I can try to put in the chat. So there's been a lot on this. Uh, you know, ultimately it seems pretty clear from a legal perspective that the two treaties are completely uh, complementary and has always been the intent, and it's in the letter as well that they are. Um, and in terms of kind of uh, nuclear weapon state, um, their approach to this, I think, you know, it, it, of course it's really important that nuclear armed states do join this treaty. Uh, it's a really important step forward for disarmament. Um, but it's also really important that they recognize the sovereign rights of other countries to join this treaty. And that has been a real, a real issue that we've seen is the pressure from nuclear armed states uh, and, and some of their allies on, on other countries to not join this treaty. And we even saw a report of the United States issuing, issuing a letter to countries that had joined this treaty to withdraw their instrument of ratification, uh, which is really a detrimental move to kind of the entire system of, of uh, multilateralism and international treaties. And, and we certainly hope, you know, that under the Biden administration, uh, this behavior will discontinue, but that that all nuclear armed states will recognize this, this uh, treaty is a really important contribution to international peace and security uh, and, and the right of other countries to join. And I realize I've taken a lot of time, so I will stop there. No, but that's great. And you cleared up that, that question about complementarity and the MPT and the, the TPNW, because I know that that does float around a lot. And thanks for sharing. If you could share those resources that you mentioned in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Um, um, Marjan, over to you. What are your thoughts on, on those wide array of questions? Yeah, since a lot of things were mentioned, uh, I just would like to highlight the importance of um, education, uh, the global education, I would say, especially among younger generation who are quite um, abstractly uh, realizing about the danger uh, and the risk connected uh, with the nuclear weapons and we see that a lot of young people are being mobilized uh, in the field of um, climate protection and climate crisis however there is a nexus between climate change as well as nuclear weapons and this should be um, probably clearly be stated or done through more research and development uh, by supporting uh, science diplomacy uh, next point uh, would be about the intergenerational dialogue. I think even now in our uh, panel, we can see that we do have this exchange. Um, we do have a dialogue between generations because um, the importance of knowledge, skills and experience being passed from the previous generations to the next generations is quite significant, especially when it comes to nuclear disarmament topic, because it doesn't only relate to the Cold War times. Um, and it's uh, still actual in our times and nuclear weapons still exist and they still pose a danger. Um, what else? Um, 
I guess uh, I would also just uh, mention um, about the role of um, Parliament and the members of uh, Parliament. Uh, there has been recently a handbook uh, issued, uh, the Parliamentary Disarmament Handbook, uh, which is providing a lot of practical measures as well as an examples of how to engage the members of Parliament. And it can be also of use for civil society representatives and anybody interested in this topic to actually make a contribution and get engaged.